afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming to listen to my lecture on stress nuclear. I'm going to be discussing a little bit of, about the myth, uh, methodology of uh, uh, nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging. And I really could have gone many different ways with this. It's a kind of a very open you know, title for the talk. So I thought, you know, let me hit on some major points maybe that you know, we should emphasize more with y'all when you guys are rotating through the nuclear lab. We teach you how to read, but at least here we can really focus on some basic stuff that you actually need for your uh, exams. So I was gonna talk about some basic principles of myocardial perfusion imaging. We'll get into a uh, little bit about the stress protocols that we use here at HMH. We'll talk about radio tracers that are employed, uh, some of the different imaging protocols that we use that you'll see uh, with us. And finally, a little bit then as to not how to interpret these images that we'll teach you in the lab, but what do we do with the data that you receive uh, from a, a nuclear stress test? I, I hope I can accomplish all of this. So first thing to do is uh, to understand what happens in the ischemic cascade, right? So when a patient has an area of his heart that doesn't receive enough blood flow, there's a sequence of events that occur, and this is called the ischemic cascade. First thing that you obtain are perfusion abnormalities. This is followed by diastolic dysfunction, followed by systolic dysfunction. Finally, then, do you see any EKG changes and then the, the very last thing that occurs in the ischemic cascade is the patient will actually have chest pain. So part of the uh, concept of uh, stress testing is we use an imaging modality to able to help us identify the ischemia that is occurring. And if you'll notice, come of the, uh, a couple of different techniques that we employ, such as echocardiography or uh, dibutyrin MRI, we're looking at actual wall motion abnormalities as the surrogate for ischemia. Nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging is, further, is higher up on the food chain where we're actually looking at the perfusion abnormality. So the very first event that occurs, uh, the perfusion abnormality, that's where nuclear imaging um, uh, identifies the flow disparity. And we hope that, you know, um, uh, that this could theoretically be, uh, therefore, more of a sensitive technique. The second thing that's important to realize about stress testing is that in order to create a flow disparity between a normal and an abnormal artery, you must stress the patient. And this was a very famous paper by Lance Gould, you all are all very familiar with. And what it shows you is that here at the bottom, if you have normal resting flow is preserved in the heart until a very, very tight lesion um, um, uh, is present, such as let's say 90%. And then after that, that's when flow decreases. But that's not the case when you stress a patient. When you stress a patient, you can see here right around maybe 50, 60%, that's when flow starts decreasing. And so this is um, a, a very important, and this is why we need a patient to be, to be stressed is this is how you create the flow disparity between a patient at rest and between a patient at rest, at stress. And so I hope uh, this uh, graphic maybe help explain things. You know, at rest, with the um, auto vasodilation that occurs, the body is able to maintain flow despite having a significant stenosis. Whereas with exercise, now you have, you've increased flow, pressure drop across the lesion occurs, um, um, and you're not able to maintain the same flow in the diseased artery as you are in the normal artery. And therefore, there's a flow disparity in the heart. And this is what we use with nuclear imaging to try to identify. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. So this is just, um, you know, some simple things that, you know, you've seen doing, but this is hopefully really the, the, the basic principles of all stress testing. You need a stress. You need some technique to identify the ischemia or the flow disparity, and this is what a stress test is. Now, types of stress, how do, we ex how do we stress patients? Either you get them to exercise, or you use pharmacological stress, either with vasodilators or uh, a chronotropic agent with dibunamine. We have many different ways to identify ischemia. Um, in this, our case today, we'll be talking mostly about spec perfusion imaging. And then you have the end result of a stress test, 
And this test, hopefully I'll show you, is, not, is helpful beyond just identifying coronary artery disease. Hopefully it can help you quantify uh, the degree of disease that you have and also then be able to estimate prognosis. All right, so let's move on. So the next part of the talk I'd like to discuss is about stress protocols. Um, you know, the preferred method of testing, everybody knows this, if you have a patient who can exercise, who's not limited by, uh, you know, either orthopedic uh, issues, you know, you really want to get them to exercise. And there's many, many reasons, the most important of which is you're able to monitor them there during their exercise, their heart rate, their blood pressure, and you're able to see their EKG, and you're able to see what their functional capacity is. And so the guidelines all strongly recommend that if you have a patient who can ad ex exercise adequately, you have an interpretable EKG, really exercise should be the way you go. Um, why is knowing a patient's functional capacity important? Uh, it's been a very, you know, exercise has been shown to be a very important prognostic factor. Patients who can exercise uh, extensively, those who can achieve 13 METs, these patients have excellent prognosis, regardless of whatever we try to do to them. Um, those patients who have a great METs greater than 10, again, you know, studies have shown medical therapy is as good as bypasses in these patients. And then finally, those patients, as you can understand, those patients who have, are not able to exercise well, who have who get less than five METs, this is a high-risk population who are prone to more events. So very important to be able to exercise. And then these are just some slides showing you the importance of, being, uh, of a patient's uh, exercise capacity. The white you can see are patients with known cardiovascular disease. And what you can see is that the more the patient is able to exercise, there really isn't much difference between a patient in prognosis between a patient um, uh, who has known disease with one who doesn't have known disease, hence the importance of uh, functional testing. And then as your exercise ability decreases, you can see the prognosis is worth in both patient populations. This is just another study also showing you that if you're able to achieve more than 10 METs of exercise, it is extremely unlikely to be able to find that you will find ischemia on any of these uh, stress tests that we have discussed. So again, the importance of the ability to exercise and the information we get out of it. Now, classically, there are different uh, exercise protocols available. You all know that we employ the Bruce protocol. This is a protocol where every three minutes, the, uh, the, the, the grade of the uh, uh, treadmill increases as well as the speed. Um, um, and um, this is what we commonly employ. Um, and this is just a slide showing you that it, when it comes to stress testing with exercise, it's very important that they reach this 85% target heart rate. You can see the sensitivity of this test here um, in blue in those patients who don't achieve target heart rate is markedly decreased um, um, even uh, when it comes, when, even when using an, um, uh, an imaging agent. And then finally, it's important to know who should not exercise. Um, but um, um, an important point is that for those patients who are unable to exercise or have baseline EKG changes, we do have another option for them. We have vasodilator stress. Uh, we have pharmacological stressor agents. We have the vasodilator ag agents, which are dipyridamol, adenosine, and regadenosine. Remember, regadenosine is the one I'm really going to be talking about because I think that's probably 99% of the patients you guys are dealing with. And then we have the chronotropic agents that we've kind of gotten away from, which are dibutamine. Who should get pharmacological stress? Those patients who can't exercise, who may have contraindications to exercise, who have abnormal EKGs or baseline EKG changes that would make uh, EKG interpretation compromised. And then anybody, of course, who is in an arrhythmia, recent MI, or somebody who may already be on anti-ischemic drugs and you would not be able to achieve your target heart rate. So these drugs, uh, all the, vas the vasodilator drugs work through the uh, adenosine pathways. The, the key pathway that we're interested in is the A2A receptor, which is responsible for coronary vasodilation. Adenosine diuropyridamol actually, unfortunately, have a lot of side effects, which include AV block, bronchospasm, and this is because they affect the other adenosine receptors uh, in addition to the A2A receptor. 
Fortunately, nowadays, we have regadenosin, which is an A to A receptor um, and has markedly decreased side effects of bronchospasm and AV block. Uh, um, I, I do remember that, what do you call it, how this drug is administered. It, it's really made life easy in the lab. You have about um, this 0.4 uh, micrograms in a 5 ml syringe. You inject it over 10 seconds. You follow that by saline flush. And then at 20 seconds uh, from the time of injection, you're ready to go ahead and um, uh, inject your radio tracer. So that's uh, important to know. Um, there are some side effects that patients feel. Most of the time, they tell you there's a flushing or a redness. They may have some of these other ones. Remember, we do have a reversal agent, aminophilin. One of the uh, questions that may be on the board is that if you do have a patient with a history of seizures and they were to develop a seizure on regadenosin, uh, 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 if, you don't, if you do not know, aminophilin is not the correct choice there. The correct choice is to proceed with a benzodiazepine as you would with any other seizure. Uh, Regadenosin is uh, contraindicated in certain conditions. You know, you and anybody who is actively wheezing or has severe asthma, uh, uh, just in case it does affect some of the uh, 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 adenosine receptors in the lung, we try to avoid this drug. Uh, those patients who are on caffeine, caffeine or um, or, or dipyridamol are actual um, an antagonists to uh, a binding of the regadenosin to its receptors, and hence why we're really adamant that these patients be um, caffeine-free for a minimum of 12 hours, if not longer. And then anybody with high degrees of AV block, you obviously don't want to be getting this drug. Uh, we often get questions about caffeine. This is just a very nice study showing you that it is important that your patient be caffeine-free. Uh, this is a drug sh a study showing you that those patients um, who are on caffeine here as measured in the red, you can see there's a significantly decrease in the size of the perfusion abnormalities that's seen. So just showing you that there is a loss of sensitivity uh, when you stress a patient on caffeine. Uh, what about patients with lung disease? As long as they're stable and they're not actively wheezing, you can definitely use, or on um, home oxygen, uh, you can definitely use regadenosin. Um, and the final question we get about stress testing with vasodilators is, well, what do we do with those patients who are on anti-ischemic drugs? Well, then this becomes very important. To, we know that if you are on anti-ischemic drugs, as this paper shows in those patients, this teal color, you can see that, again, the sensitivity of the test, the ability to predict the true perfusion defect is markedly reduced when you're on anti-ischemic drugs. So these drugs are very th beneficial for what they claim to do. Um, so I guess it depends on the question. You know, if your question is in a, to first diagnose CAD, then you want to make sure your patient are, is not on AV nodal blocking drugs. However, if you have a patient who's a non coronary artery disease patient, maybe has had bypass, is on medical therapy, and you just want to assess the, his remnant risk, then um, um, you know these are the patients that you can continue uh, with vasodilatory stress um, on therapy. Okay, so we talked uh, about some basic principles of stress testing. We've discussed, you know, uh, uh, pharmacological and exercise stress testing. Let's talk about a very fruitful topic uh, for the exams, which are the, the differences between the radio tracers. And here it's a, just important to remember what Dr. Mamarian's lectures were. You know, what are we doing? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, you have a patient, either they're in the resting state or you're in the uh, um, uh, stress state. And what we're trying to do with radio tracers is you want this radio tracer to go and get deposited into the heart in proportion to the blood flow that is present in the state that you've administered this radio tracer. So whether they're in stress or rest, you inject this radio tracer. You hope that the isotope is such, ideally, that it's extracted in relationship, extracted by the uh, viable myocyte in relationship to the flow that it's achieved. You hope that the, the myocyte uh, uh, takes this radio tracer, traps it, and retains it some, for some period of time. So then by the time you put your patient on the uh, uh, table, you can image them. Active gamma rays are admitted from your patient. We have very um, uh, uh, exquisite, um, um, what do you call it, uh, cameras now that go and capture this gamma ray information 
convert it to a light signal, and then display it to you as the digital pictures that y'all are used to seeing. So this is kind of what, you know, the, the talk from Dr. Mamarian's uh, talk, just showing you, you know, the, the basic, uh, basic principles of, of nuclear imaging and what we're trying to achieve. So if ideally, if you could have the most ideal radio tracer, you would want a radio tracer which has, is linear to uh, blood flow with the highest myocardial extraction. You want it, again, linear to flow, especially at high flow rates. You don't want it to contaminate other, um, uh, you don't want extra cardiac activity that can contaminate your interpretation of your perfusion images. You don't want it to have much redistribution, so you can image the patient later in time and make it easy for the patient in throughput. And you want easy and stable labeling. So unfortunately right now, um, these are uh, the, uh, you know, the different PET and um, SPECT radio tracers we have. And unfortunately, you know, we don't necessarily have the most ideal um, uh, tracers. Uh, what we do have is, you know, the best radio tracer that we have, of course, with PET, and this is O15 water. You can see as flow rate increases, the tracer uptake into the myocardium is very linear uh, with blood flow. The SPECT agents, such as technetium, the technetium agents, you can see are not linear with flow. So as you increase blood flow, there's this plateauing effect or roll-off of, of, of phenomenon that is observed. So as you increase flow, it doesn't track linearly. Um, you actually have a roll-off and you have, uh, you know, there's no added deposition of the radio tracer in the myocardium as flow increases. Now, this can be a problem for us because, remember, we are trying to see differences in uh, flow between a stress and rest state. So if, depending on the degree of stenosis, the more the two images are alike, the difficult it can be for us to pick up a true perfusion abnormality. So you, ideally, you know, of course, you would love to have radio traces that are more um, um, linear with flow. The other SPECT agent that we use is thallium. You can see thallium, um, uh, we'll talk about this, um, has a much better, um, 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 a much more uh, linear relationship with coronary blood flow and a much higher myocardial extraction fraction. Believe it or not, rubidium, although it's better than technetium agents, you can see here that it's, it's still um, um, a thallium is a better when it comes to tracking flow. So um, a very important slide to understand. Um, uh, main points are you want a radio tracer that because we're trying to detect differences in flow between normal and abnormal myocardial tissue, you really want to have a radio tracer which tracks flow in its true sense. Because any radio tracer that does not tr correctly track flow, you could potentially miss ischemia or miss a perfusion abnormality, or, or potentially miss a flow disparity. Uh, this is just studies that are, you know, complicated. I'm just going to word through it, but this, the gold standard is microspheres. And basically what this shows is if you're using thallium or any of the te uh, 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 technetium projects, you are significantly uh, underestimating flow um, at, uh, compared to the gold standard microspheres. And this is just one study, where, where a clinical study that looked at defect sizes using thallium and tetrafosamine. And you can see here, we would, because thallium tracks flow more in relation to, um, 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 in better relation to flow, you can see here perfusion defect sizes are actually larger with thallium than they are with technetium. Again, showing you that, you know, there is some underestimation of flow with the technetium-based agents. This is probably one of those slides that you know, I would spend a lot of time to uh, review prior to taking your board exam. This is specifically for the SPECT agents. Next time, uh, I'll add for the PET agents. Uh, basically comparing the differences of the two uh, uh, agents that you guys are used to seeing in our lab. Thallium, as you know, most of the time we're using for viability imaging. I'll explain you why. And then really for most of our myocardial perfusion imaging, which is technetium 99M. So why do we use what we do uh, for each, and what is the strengths and differences? Well, first thing is what you have to know is thallium is a low energy photon. It's a low energy photon, 
And what this predisposes to is because it's low energy, you can imagine it interacts with anything it comes into its path with. So there's a much higher incidence of scatter and absorption and everything else that causes um, a, a nuclear cardiologist a lot of discomfort when um, um, uh, interpreting an image. Technetium, on the other hand, is a much higher energy photon. And what that means is it will interact much less with its environment um, as it's being emitted from the patient's chest and um, on its way to the gamma camera for detection. So that's, that's um, one, uh, one advantage of technetium. It's a higher energy photon. Second advantage um, of technetium is that its half-life is much smaller than um, um, thallium. Its half-life is six hours as opposed to 73 hours. And why this becomes important is, is because this limits the dose of radiation that you can, total radiation dose that you can administer of thallium to your patient. Because thallium hangs around for a long time. And so you can imagine there's, your patient is constantly being exposed to radiation. So hence, in the end, we ended having up to give a much lower dose of thallium because of its lower half-life than we are with technetium. And as Dr. Mamarian has told you so many times, it's all about counts. The more counts you have, the better image quality you have. You're just not able to achieve as many counts with thallium as you can with technetium because you have to inject less because of its longer half time. And then unfortunately, because it's a lower energy photon, it interacts a lot more with its uh, environment before it hits the gamma camera. So what does this all spell out? You can imagine your image quality with thallium would be far inferior than with technetium. Other things that are important, um, you know, we talked about how thallium tracks better with blood flow, has a higher myocardial extraction fraction, and thallium has this great property of redistribution, where once it's, uh, it on, after it's on first pass perfusion, wherever there's living myocytes, because it comes in through, the, it works through the sodium potassium ATPase pump, it will make its way to living tissue. Hence why we use it for viability imaging. This is not the case with technetium. Technetium just goes straight to the mitochondria and, does not and gets trapped there and does not have the ability to, um, um, to, uh, to diffuse into, um, it remains fixed at its uh, target site. Uh, we use this to our advantages. Thallium is used for viability imaging. Also with thallium, if you were using it for perfusion imaging, you don't necessarily need to do a reinjection with a second dose because you have an agent that will always you know, continue to fill into living myocardium. Whereas with technetium, you know, it again, it stays fixed to where it is and you need two doses if you're doing crest imaging. This is just a slide going over more of the same of the things, but main thing I can't stress to enough is thallium. You know, it has a property of redistribution and image quality is lower because you're using a lower energy photon and you're getting less counts because you're giving less total dose of the thallium because of its very long half time and therefore you're limited by the amount of radiation you can give. Not the case with technetium. Technetium is a higher energy photon. You can give a higher dose, get better image quality, and it has the property of no redistribution. This says it one more time for those who didn't get it. <laughs> but the point that I really, really kept this slide was for is that, you know, the other advantage of um, uh, thallium um, is that you really don't have a lot of the GI uptake that you do with technetium. Um, um, yeah, and I, I have a slide coming up where I'll show you that. So here is this. Quick question. Is this sestamibi or is this thallium? Anybody call it up? Okay, I heard both. Uh, Sestamibi was correct. Uh, Sestamibi, the Sestamibi is eliminated through the hepatobiliary system, and hence why you see the liver gallbladder all lit up. Uh, thallium is eliminated through the KUB system, the kidney, urine, or bladder, and, and those organs would be bright in, in this study. Okay, so next is imaging protocols. Um, um, I'll explain you, you know, a little bit of how we do things here at HMH and why. Um, so, as you well know, um, if you read any of our guidelines, there are many different ways to stress a patient. We have two-day protocols. We have one-day protocols. We have one-day protocols that start with rest and end with stress. We have one-day protocols that start with stress and end with rest. We have all of these protocols. You know, uh, and there's advantages to both. If you do a two-day protocol, you get, you know, you're getting the same counts in both studies. 
you know, uh, but the problem is you're requiring two separate days, and this can be a major inconvenience for the patient. Single isot I mean, same day protocols had the advantage of all getting it done one day, much more convenient for the patient, faster hospital discharge. But the problem is, you know, you have a difference uh, in um, count statistics between your, uh, theoretically, between your stress and rest images. So they have issues. Most important thing, you know, we won't spend too much time on it, is because I think you're experiencing something very different here at Methodist. As you know here, we employ a stress-first imaging protocol. And that means all of our patients are um, having a stress-first protocol. And we decide whether they're going to be a one-day or two-day um, um, based on their body size and composition rather than, you know, um, uh, on, um, you know, how, what, what strict protocol we're following. So what do I mean? So, you know, if we have a patient that comes, whether they have known CAD or not, we are going to be doing stress imaging first. For those patients who are smaller, we're going to do a low-dose stress. For those patients who are heavier, large BMIs, or patients who have large chest sizes, we're going to be doing high-dose. Um, and we only perform rest imaging if the stress is abnormal, if the patient presents late to the lab, um, um, and, you know, and you, know, you, 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 um, you may not have enough radio tracer left, or if they've had recent caffeine uptake. So we're very big proponents of this uh, stress first, and I will show you why in the next few slides. Uh, this is just an example of these protocols in action, and I'll just go over the first one because most of the time we do it one day. We stress our patients, we inject the technetium, you know, within uh, four, 30 to 45 minutes, we're imaging the patient. That is when a physician and a technologist are reviewing these images. If the image is completely normal, your patient is done. We are not performing rest imaging on these patients. What does normal mean? Normal means nice homogeneous perfusion throughout the myocardium, a normal LV size, and a normal LV function. If there is any abnormality in the stress image, only then are we proceeding with rest imaging. We give three times the radi uh, radiation dose that we used in the stress image. Another 30 to 40 uh, minutes later, we perform rest imaging, and then the physician does his final review. Some patients you may have seen who may be markedly uh, large, you know, we're giving a high dose stress, and then, yes, if the study is abnormal, we may bump these patients for rest imaging the following day. This is, um, you know, most of these patients, as you know, there's a very high normalcy rate. Uh, so a lot of these patients still get done in one day. But yes, in some of the larger patients, it may be that we bump them to two days with, with these protocols. But that would have been the case regardless with any technique. And um, so why, why stress first imaging here at Houston Methodist? And this is really done uh, or published by Dr. Chang and started by Dr. Varani, a uh, very important history at Houston Methodist, where you can see the prognosis of those patients who have stress only um, um, uh, by Dr. Chang's study is the same whether it compared to those patients who had both stress and rest testing, be it with exercise or pharmacological test, uh, testing. This was also shown in a smaller study by Dr. Duval in another cohort where he also showed no difference in prognosis in those patients who have stress-only imaging as opposed to both having stress and rest. The other thing Dr. Chang showed was that if you perform the stress-first approach, there is a 61% radiopharmaceutical dose reduction to the patient. So this is not benign. So not only do you decrease the radiation dose to your patient, which we know now is very important with all the medical imaging that's performed, it's a faster throughput because it's half the study, so these patients get, you know, dispoed out much quicker. Um, and then let's not forget our very important technologists uh, who are in the audience as well. They're exposed to less radiation, and their careers are also a lifetime of radiation exposure. So this is a benefit to everyone uh, in, in, in regard. Um, PET, hopefully I'll, I'll put in more slides and just reemphasizing, you know, PET has its own protocols, Dr. Amala has uh, spoken to you on this. You know, they, they do the scout imaging, they inject the rubidium because it has a much shorter half-life. They image just quickly over seven minutes. The drug, you know, it, it, you know um, the, uh, the uh, rubidium wears out quickly. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they do rest first and then they do the stress. The ribbon wears out quickly. So, you know, the total time of the test is just 25 minutes. The other advantage is you get a calcium score with it. So, um, and these are protocols that you guys have seen. All right, so I'm doing really good on time. Um, <laughs> so um, now the portion of it, you've, I think I hope we've worked up through some good steps. You understand. If they've had caffeine, let's say your patient came in with caffeine, uh, what we would probably do is we'd start with rest imaging first. Yeah, instead of that being a wasted day, we'll go ahead and get uh, acquire rest images and then do, uh, because you never know if you needed the rest image anyways, you know, the following day. So you're, you're not, in other words, you're not stressing the patient, you're altering from the stress first approach only because they have caffeine which interferes with your egg adenosine. Okay, so the next part, um, image interpretation, you know, I, you know, I think um, um, we, you, you come to the lab, we teach, we'll teach you how to read. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. What I think a lot of us agree is maybe we want to, you know, uh, we want you to know what this data actually means that you're dealing with. And so for the next few slides, uh, I, I will talk a lot about, you know, how, you know when you get these results, um, um, what you should know the literature has taught to us about, the, about risk stratification and how it can maybe help you in making better decisions for your patients. So here is a, a normal, uh, here is a myocardial perfusion imaging study. Um, we have short axis, you know, you've got the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the two chamber and the four chamber cuts. Uh, we have a, an ejection fraction and wall motion here on the right hand side. We have what these polar maps are. And what I want you to know is, and, and if you see in the study just quickly, you have a perfusion abnormality at stress, which fills in on rest, and this would be a case of ischemia. And what I want you to know is that these pictures are a lot more than just perfusion. So you're getting a lot of information here. You are learning where the ischemia is, where the perfusion abnormality is, you're learning the severity of the ischemia. You're learning about the extent of the ischemia. You're learning about the function of the heart, um, um, your, the volumes of the heart, um, and you know if there are any other high risk findings. So this is more, much more than perfusion. And why this is important? Because each of these pieces, the perfusion, the 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 quantification, the, the ejection fraction, all of this together will tell you, you know, will help you, you know, with diagnostic accuracy of the test, but more importantly, indicate the prognosis of your patient. So all of these information is together, and I'll, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So there's always often questions about polar maps, um, you know, basically what the polar map is doing is, you know, bit, it is comparing the stress image to a, norm, uh, a normal database that we have here. Basically, any per, uh, compared, compared to the normal database, any area of the heart that's less than two standard deviations from the known database is marked as abnormal. And then you're looking at the rest images to see whether the image filled in or not. If it filled in, the computer will call it ischemia. If it didn't fill in, it's called it scar. So that's, just a brief uh, kind of overview of how the polar maps work. But main point of the slide is these are, the knowledge you're getting out of this data is way more just than um, uh, looking at the perfusion. Now, uh, what it, how good is this test? Um, this is just one of several studies. Uh, this was, a, you know, um, I, I, I took, uh, there's many different studies, but I hope you can see here when you compare it to you know, uh, echocardiography, you know, and the other techniques. Uh, SPECT is a very reliable test. It has a very high sensitivity, as would be, remember, on the ischemic cascade, as we would um, uh, expect. 
Specificity in the literature is uh, variable. In this particular study, it was 77. But uh, we have to, there's, um, yeah, uh, we'll go over that. But you know, the, the, you can see here, PET is, of course, um, as we know, as with PET and CMR, have slightly better sensitivity and specificity than SPEC. Um, you know, we've talked about exercise and the different vasodilators and chronotropic agents. One of the common questions is, well, does my diagnostic accuracy suffer if I choose one of these other tests? And this study, and along with many other studies, have shown no. That whatever stressor you're using, the diagnostic accuracy is preserved. Prognosis is another question we'll go over, but the diagnostic accuracy for the detection of coronary artery disease is preserved. Uh, this is just a trial showing you um, that uh, the next question, well, does it matter what radio tracer do, do I use? And as you can imagine here, what you'll notice is that in those, if you look at technetium and thallium, sensitivity is the same for both tests. But as would be expected, because thallium, which is in black, has the worst image quality, specificity suffers. Um, so that's an important point to note. And that was, again, seen here with B versus thallium. Again, you know, you have I, the same levels of uh, sensitivity um, between these two radio tracers, so you're not going to miss disease. But when it comes to specificity, because of the poor image quality with thallium, your specificity suffers. So just some important things to know about diagnostic accuracy with these testing. Now, just like every other technique, we have ways to improve our specificity. Uh, so a lot of the, those studies that I showed you may not have necessarily been employing these techniques. These are techniques you see us doing in our lab all the time. So you know, remember, we use MIBI instead of thallium. We use gated spec to help us improve our specificity. A lot of our cameras have attenuation correction, which we are using. And you know how much of a fan we are of prone imaging. So all of these help you um, uh, improve your specificity. All right. So um, the next portion of the talk is really, we've, gone, we've discussed diagnostic accuracy. Now let's talk about prognosis, which is really you know, why people, prognosis and risk stratification and prognosis, which is really where the bulk of data still today, you know, nuclear, cardio, nuclear cardiology has the most data when it comes to prognosis compared to any other imaging technique. And main thing I want you to remember is that you know, when you have a combination of perfusion and function, uh, you know, this is very, very powerful prognostic information. So this is just a, a slide in over 70,000 patients, all right? Followed for an average of 2.3 years. These were low to intermediate risk patients who had nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging. And you can see the event rate over two to three years was less than 1% per year in a cohort and of many different studies performed over multiple time periods, totaling almost 70,000 patients. Dr. Shah, just bear with me. We, we'll address your concerns. <laughs> but this is, the, this is the literature. And so this is a very, very good test for risk stratification. We can identify a patient who is at low risk, OK? Um, um, but you know, I mean, as Dr. Shah has pointed out, look, uh, you know, the risk is context uh, contextual. You really have to put it in the, you know, um, what do you call it, in reference to your particular patient. We'll still be able to identify a high risk patient and a low risk patient, but in certain subgroups, such as those who have pharmacological stress, those who have diabetics, chronic kidney disease, and those who have known CAD. A normal stress test does not necessarily imply less than 1%. These patients are, uh, have more than 1% risk, but it is def it, it, it's still a prognostically a low-risk population. And these are multiple trials uh, evaluating that. And I'll just give you an example. If you look at exercise and pharmacological, if you exercise and have a normal nuke, your risk is 0.6% per year. If you do pharmacological stress, just the fact that you can't exercise you know, this is a population that's at high risk as 1.8. And you see that same trend, you know, obviously older patients have, you know, uh, increased risk. Those who have known CAD have uh, increased risk. And those who are diabetics have an increased risk. But 
Main point is, if normal, if it, you know, if you have a stress study that's normal, for that patient, they're low risk, um, uh, not necessarily less than 1% risk. Is that fair? Okay, and then this was further shown with Dr. Chang's data. I mean, uh, another very, very important contribution uh, by Dr. Chang to the literature. These were patients who had a normal, new, normal new, all had normal new, nuclear myocardial perfusion studies. And what he very nicely demonstrated is that your short-term risk is dictated by your stress myocardial perfusion study. So you have a warranty period for two years. But after that, your risk is dictated by the total degree of atherosclerotic burden that you have. So based on your calcium score. That as your uh, degree of atherosclerosis increases, your risk is now dictated by how much atherosclerosis was present. Again, showing you this interplay between, um, uh, you know, that, um, between, uh, you know, atherosclerotic plaque, myocardial perfusion imaging. All right, so um, we kind of talked about what it means to be normal. What about abnormal? So here's a case, another abnormal study. You know, what, what does this tell you about your patient? How, you know, and so study, you know, there's many studies out there. Remember, this is a tool for risk stratification. So as we had said, if you have a normal myocardial perfusion study, your risk is low. But you can see is as your degree and severity of Abnorm abnormalcy increases, or here in this particular case, uh, uh, ischemia increases, you can see there is a progressive increase in risk. So it's identifying patients who are at increased risk. Now, we're not talking about what therapy to decrease their risk. You know, we have a trial that's uh, kind of uh, um, made us ponder that more. But it does identify patients who are at increased risk. So you can see here in these curves, whether it's cardiac death or myocardial infarction, patients who have normal scan are low risk compared to those patients who have abnormal scans. And the more abnormal your scan, the greater your risk. That's one piece of the puzzle, perfusion imaging. Remember I told you quant uh, ejection fraction and volumes are also very important. So this is another study, very large study, showing you that your risk of death increases in, in, you know, in patients who had, who they followed, these were all high-risk patients with post-stress ES of less than 45%. Your risk of cardiac death increases as your ejection fraction decreases. No surprise there, right? With that, we kind of common sense, we kind of know that. But what's nice is now you can see the interplay with perfusion imaging and ejection fraction. And what you'll see here is that as we had said, as your perfusion abnormality increases, your risk increases. At the same time, if you now look at perfusion abnormality with worsening ejection fraction, you know, as your ejection fraction decreases, your risk further proportionately uh, worsens. So you have this combination of uh, ejection fraction and perfusion. So normal perfusion, normal EF, this is the best case scenario. Large perfusion abnormality with a depressed ejection fraction less than 30%, these patients are at significantly at risk. Hence, how you can use this data, looking at perfusion, looking at function, to give you an idea of the prognosis of your patient. Uh, and then this was just a slide when they looked at multivariate analysis, trying to figure out what are predictors of death. Uh, this will be on the board exams. This was on my exam. You know, predictors of death are... Um, uh, what do you call it, um, ejection fraction and the sum difference score. I'm sorry, the sum stress score. And the predictors of myocardial infarction were ischemia or your sum difference score. So this was definitely a question for me. All right, and so the idea is with all this knowledge, you'll be able to get better guide your decision making to hopefully, hopefully improve outcomes. So whether it be, you know, revascularization, anti-ischemic therapy, risk factor modification. Um, one last trial I'd like you to know about is um, what you do every day, but uh, maybe didn't take the time to think of uh, as to why we do it. And that's the issue of all these patients with stable angina. So as you know, just uh, as we had talked about, you know, you have a lot of patients who are cath in the United States today have normal coronary arteries. So um, this has, you know, um, 
So the, can you use the test as an effective gatekeeper to the cath lab? And this was the end study. This uh, looked at almost 11,000 patients which, tried to, which answered this question. Can you use, in patients who have chronic stable angina, can you use nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging followed by selective catheterization in the appropriate cohort as an effective means, um, as, as a cost-effective and safe means and, uh, 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 and get the same outcomes? And so this was addressed by the study, and basically, you know, what I, you know, the MPI strategy is in this purple color. And what I want you to note is that, first of all, this was a safe strategy. So this was a group of patients where either you got, uh, uh, you know, you either were uh, sent off to uh, uh, straight to cath lab, or you had a nuclear myocardial perfusion study and then went to the cath lab, so, uh, if, if needed. And what they found was, as you can imagine, was that, first of all, most important that, that if you do the nuclear myocardial perfusion study, that it's a safe strategy. There was no difference in events between those patients who were directly cath versus those with, uh, who followed an MPI strategy first. Next thing you sh should see is that, you know, so it's safe. Next thing you can see is those patients who go to the cath lab because, unfortunately, of the ocular stenotic uh, you know, reflex, there were a much higher degree of revascularization in the cath lab strategy. And what that ended up as a result was that the costs from direct catheterization are much higher than a strategy that if you employ nuclear imaging first by the, followed by serving as a gatekeeper to the cath lab. So trying to identify all those patients who truly have you know, normal studies preventing them getting to the cath lab and only allowing those patients who really need um, 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 uh, an invasive angiogram um, um, that are more likely to be abnormal to make their way to the cath lab. So it's safe if you do it, uh, the strategy, and it costs a whole lot less and leads to less stents. So uh, finally, you know, uh, there, you know, um, there are a whole lot of very good reasons to, uh, that are employed by the societies to uh, utilize nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging. It's a good idea just to get an idea so you are appropriately ordering these tests. Although now I know, I'm sure, that today I've motivated you to order a lot more of these. Um, but we want you to do it appropriately. And so have a read when you have a chance. OK, that's all I got. Dr. Amala will answer all questions. <laughs> so those who took the nuclear exam, did you see questions that could help uh, the other fellows? Was, this was, you know. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs>